this is a freewheeling discussion. Uh, short, uh, pithy answers from, for questions that I'll start with and then that will come from the audience. And please, if any of you feels that they would like to comment on what another person is saying, please signal so and come in. Next to each of you, you have a microphone so you can speak into it on, on each side. And uh, after the first part of the session, I will be asking you the questions. And during that time, we will be collecting questions from the audience, which my colleagues here, Dr. Faham, Dr. Nakhla, and Dr. Suleiman, will be sorting these questions and then bringing them to us. And I will repose the questions to you uh, because there are bound to be multiple questions, and this way we get maximum interaction. فجميل حاضرين هنبدأ هذه الجلسة بحوار مفتوح مع السادة الضيوف الكبار وسنبدأ الجلسة بأسئلة مني إليهم وثم في هذه الفترة في ورق بتوزع عليكم جميعا اللي عايز يكتب أي حاجة بالعربي ممكن اللي عايز يكتبها بالإنجليزي ممكن وحناخد كل الأوراق دي من الجمهور هتتجمع عند دكتور فحام والدكتور صلاح سليمان والدكتور رفيق نخلة وهم هيفرزوها عشان بيبقى في أسئلة مكررة كتير وهيجمعوها وهيدوها لي وأنا هسألها للحاضرين فمحمد فين محمد السماغ ومحمد علام تأكدوا الورق بتوزع لو في ورق زيادة الورق توزع كله علي جاد كله توزع ورق لو في ورق إضافي أي حد عايز ورق يرفع إيده هيجيبوا له ورقه جنبك في ناس بتوزع ورقه Okay, uh, we have an hour and 30 minutes, and uh, we will start with a question that arises from uh, the presentation of Richard Ernst this morning. It's an excellent uh, presentation. You saw the reaction you got. But I would like to uh, pose a question that troubles some scientists, and this is, the social responsibility of science. Does it exist or is science responsible to pursue truth based on empirical scientific method? That this is the primary function of the scientist. The scientist is also a citizen, where as a citizen he has a social responsibility, but as a scientist is there a special social responsibility above the one of being also a good citizen? Should I answer? Yes. You see, I don't like to separate science from education. I think they belong very strongly together. I mean, whenever you are doing research, you are learning by yourself, and doing research is probably the best tool for in, in education. So I think the two belong very much together. And as soon as you couple them, it, it's very clear that scientists or, in other words, educators, they have a societal responsibility because they educate the future of, of mankind. And they educate the next generations who will determine the future of, of what is going on. So in this sense, I, I'm convinced that science and education have a, a lot of responsibility. And of course, when you are in your research lab and working on a particular chemical reaction, perhaps the societal context is not what comes to your mind at first. You would like to solve a particular problem, you see that problem and you are working on it. But, I mean, in the back of, of your mind, you have a filter, a selection filter, which filters out those questions which interest you particularly and those l less. And when you have a, a societal responsibility built into yourself, your filter will work differently. And you will select different questions to work on which you find that remotely they might have a, a societal importance and other questions are perhaps of lesser importance. And in this sense, I'm sure that this kind of uh, 
so, so, societal mind will influence science quite, quite a lot. Even if in, in the problem solving itself, it will not have a great impact. Well, thank you. Let me turn to Dr. Wiesel on this one, because I think you've, you've yeah, handled no, I, that question also. Yeah, I, just thinking about the question, I had more time than my colleague here. Uh, I, I, it's, it's clear that there have been times in history of science where uh, the search for truth have led to, to the fact that you have understood the atom structure of the atom and interaction, and this in terms have led to, to the creation of atomic energy, but it also led to, to the fact that powerful weapons have been developed on basis of this scientific truth and finding. So as a scientist, we have uh, this issue of finding the truth. Sometimes, even if there is no way not to go on finding the truth, but still, this is what Professor Ernst referred to earlier today in his lecture, that the responsibility then, uh, often how this truth is handled, falls often out of the hand of the scientists into the community, into the political arena. And then the scientists have done a service to some extent, but also perhaps a disservice. So this is a, a, a complication. I had the experience uh, I, once uh, that uh, when I was at Harvard, uh, I had a, a professorship and, and one of the donors of this professorship asked me, uh, Torsten, when are we going to be able to control the mind? So I looked at him somewhat horrified and said, never, I hope. Yes. But this is again, our, in these kind of questions, I, I, I assume you had in mind that, that we, we do have uh, issues of this nature that will come up. But aren't the issues really on the application or the technological application based on the scientific knowledge discovered? Because are we, or would you be arguing that because of nuclear weapons and because of the terrible fact that they were actually used uh, and so on, would you say that scientists should have shied away from pursuing the secrets of the structure of the atom? No, as I said, I, I don't, I mean, we as scientists have, we have to follow the path. Uh, wherever it leads wherever us. Wherever it leads us. But the responsibility of the rest of the community and uh, that then will determine how this truth is handled. Well, this is a, a, a slight variant on that, if I may go to Cherry Roll and ask this question. And this is the extent to which there is a risk of the citizen, the scientist as a citizen versus scientist as scientist, to gradually become an advocate as opposed to someone who pursues the evidence and the truth wherever it leads them, even if the conclusions uh, run counter to what they started with as their beliefs, how they evolve over time with it, or do they become a strong uh, advocate? We have seen in the yeah, social well, sciences this happens. I, I, I suppose Einstein is a beautiful example, as we heard today, of, of, of someone who became an advocate for peace. And no, I didn't mean that. I meant Einstein never wavered in his scientific pursuits. Uh, he became an advocate as a citizen. In fact, Einstein is a very good example of someone doing science and then being an activist citizen. But let us take, for example, uh, in the uh, environmental field, environmental evidence. Some people feel very strongly. And the question becomes, and in fact we know that the current administration that uh, Mr. Ernst has had some reservations about have cast doubts about the objectivity of the science on climate change several times. Now they finally come around to accepting it because a lot of scientists stood by it. But there was a concern about whether scientists are being selective in, in choosing evidence to buttress their views rather than pursuing the evidence where it leads them. 
Now, this is a case where in the social sciences, it, it, the accusations are much more frequent than in the natural sciences. Now, is a scientist, therefore, is there a risk when the scientist is both has strongly held opinions as a citizen and as a scientist, is there a risk of the social opinions impacting on the scientific work? I, I think the Microphone, please. I think the scientist uh, needs to make public the, the risks that are involved, that is, uh, the, the associations that they have that might lead you to, to <clears throat> expect a certain answer. I could start out by saying that, uh, for instance, well, in, in 1970, the, uh, I went to a meeting that eventually led to being invited to the meeting where I heard about CFCs. But the first one meeting was at environmental applications of radioactivity. And uh, when I went to that meeting and realized that this was a, a, an easy experiment for us to do, was to measure the mercury concentration in fish using a technique that involved nuclear reactors. And having bought a nuclear reactor, myself for my personal use at the university, I, I feel that I should tell people that, that, that there's that, that risk that you have that, I, that I'm a radiochemist. And in fact, a, uh, the first experiment that we did after that, that meeting was to measure the mercury concentration in fish. Uh, the fish that we were looking at were from museums uh, and they were very old. Uh, so that uh, and our, our result uh, that we found was that, yes, the mercury concentrations in swordfish and tuna fish were high. They were high in, we were doing this work in 1971. They were high in 1971, but they were high in 1878, too. So that it wasn't really pollution, it was a matter that concentrates going through the food chain. Uh, and yes, there is a, hen there is a, 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 a possible harm from eating fish that have 0.5 parts per million of mercury, but it's not a pollution problem, it's a problem that have been associated with those fish all along. Well, obviously, uh, some people immediately assume that I'm an anti-environmentalist because I didn't come to the what they thought was the obvious conclusion that, that I would draw. Uh, but then the next time, the next time after that, it was a $2 billion business in chlorofluorocarbons, and recommended that this was a, was, was a danger. But again, they have the question, of, am I, at a certain point, uh, for instance, in discussions in the Montreal Protocol that was led, you used, uh, that led to the banning of the CFCs. Uh, if you were from one of the companies, then of course you had an interest in it and were represented. Uh, because I had said that there was a problem uh, that disqualified me for being used as a, a, a for anything except of the scientific background, but not as a judge, as, a, as an arbiter. Not as an arbiter, because you might be yes, you might be swayed. Well, I think this is a, a very commendable uh, way of noting in advance potential conflict of interest, uh, and highly commendable. But let me ask a, a, a slightly different question. Uh, so far, we've been talking about the scientist as an individual he or she uh, pursuing certain views, pursuing certain events. Increasingly, a lot of work is done by scientific teams and people who may not share the same uh, political, uh, social, ideological spectra. And uh, is it possible in your judgment for people with radically different political views, some very conservative, some very liberal, uh, to work together on the same problem without these views interfering as long as the science is there to bind them together, the natural science, and the scientific method, and the empiricism, and so on. Go ahead, Richard. Uh, Microphone, please. My I think it, it should be possible, because sure. in, in science there should be some objectivity, which is not influenced by a, a political 
incentive for a political opinion. And I think on the fundamental research level, we really should explore nature and the problems as they are, and not influence the findings by our preconceived notion. And, but afterwards, when, when the results have been found, then we have to formulate our opinions and uh, for, uh, formulate what we think could be dangerous in usage of these results. So then, of course, all these opinions are, are coming along. But that's uh, on a second stage. When the, res the research essentially has been done, then we ask ourselves, but now what is being done with our results in industry? And when industry really picks it up and does something bad with it, we should speak up. We should speak up and express our opinion that, and think and say what we think is not decent and what shouldn't be done. But that's on a different level. That has nothing to do with the basic research, but finally with the results, with the exploitation of the results by society. Uh, the Dorsen result, you agree with, uh, with that view that it is possible to put aside political views uh, from all ends of the spectrum and just collaborate on the, on the science? Yeah, I don't know what all end of the spectrum means <laughs> exactly uh, because it seems that, uh, I mean, in my experience in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, program, uh, there are certainly Palestinian scientists who work with Israeli and uh, their opinion in terms of politics uh, is, is, uh, is, is extreme, but, but yeah. they can get together on the science. Yeah, because uh, as I tried to say earlier, that science can be a bridge, and if the, uh, if the um, uh, main, uh, the central interest in your life is to develop a scientific program, then that overrides uh, so basically, I think I agree with uh, Richard uh, on, on uh, that. I think, I mean, what, what surprised to me has been the, the scientists in general tend to be open-minded. Well, and, the, uh, I think, uh, let, let me then extend this and ask uh, uh, Sherry Rowland this question. Uh, a lot of our big issues the kinds of issues that uh, Jeff Sachs was talking about earlier today. Uh, a lot of people consider that these must be done in a multidisciplinary fashion, and that must involve economists and social scientists and anthropologists, as well as natural scientists, epidemiologists, etc. Uh, now, do you believe, leaving aside, if people working on the same technical problem despite the political opinions can get together over the technical problem. Can people coming from different disciplines and completely different backgrounds meet in a really joint endeavor? Or do we have uh, C.P. Snow's uh, famous two cultures that cannot be bridged? I, I will just reminding me of a meeting of a, a this was a, um, group that was put together by the National Academy of Sciences, and it was in, in the late 1990s. Uh, and it was on the questions of the water problems associated with the Jor River Jordan. And the, the conclusion, the uh, committee that was put together by the, the Academy of Sciences uh, included Israelis and Palestinians, uh, Jordanians, uh, and U.S. And uh, they worked together for three years. Uh, they, I think when they first met, they went off separately to have dinner after their meetings. By the time they were halfway through, uh, they were all going off together. And uh, by the end, I think they uh, had good friends and uh, regretted the, the political differences that were separating them between their political entities, but that they, uh, my impression in general is it's possible to put uh, people together, the scientists together, in ways that they uh, will find that, that they can have satisfactory discussions.
but on the humanities, social sciences, and the natural sciences. Now, do we have simply different chapters written by different people put in between the covers of one volume, or do we have a real interaction between the social sciences, the humanities, and the natural sciences in attacking a joint problem? That's, that's a question that the National Research Council, which is the operating entity yeah. of the National Academy of Sciences, faces every time they put together a committee, is that they have to look at it as to uh, gender balance, racial balance, political balance. Uh, at least it means that they have to, to uh, talk with each other or talk in the presence of the other because the committee is, uh, isn't all of, all of one mind on many things. Dorsten, you want to say? I think it's, um, it's also that there is a merging of, uh, of sciences. For a while, physicists didn't really want to talk to biologists because uh, physics were, as a discipline, much far further advanced. Now, biologists and, and physicists and mathematicians will all work together. It had become truly, in, modern biology is truly interdisciplinary, drawing on, and the social sciences are, are coming into that. As first coming in was cognitive science, and psychology is now part of, of this community. And t to my mind, social science is still not experimental enough in my view, yes. <laughs> but it, it, no doubt. And the movement, I think, the trend today is more, very much that social science is becoming a science uh, more than perhaps has been uh, in a science that would meet sort of the criteria that some of us would like to see met uh, in, in, in this discipline. So I think it's a matter of time. Uh, Richard, you want to I think whenever you want to collaborate across borders, you have to have something in common. And unless you have something in common, you cannot collaborate. So that means if you are a scientist and want to collaborate with somebody from the humanities, you have to have some interest in the other field as well. You have part of that already in your brain, otherwise you can't talk to, to each other. And I think that's, that's very important to, to remember, which means to have a broad background. If you are just a specialist in your own field, you have another specialist in another field, you don't find each other together. And so don't stamp people. There are no just chemists and physicists and, and sociologists. Everybody should know a little bit of the other field as well. So don't put these stamps on people and people develop in the course of their lifetime also and, and change their interests and change, increase their knowledge. And that makes them more universal. Well, it, uh, it certainly does uh, give us a, a series of challenges uh, to deal with. Uh, but let me then uh, take you towards an even more difficult bridge. Uh, how about science and religion? Now, the late Stephen Jay Gould had a view, which has always impressed me, is that science and religion are in non-overlapping magisteria each with its own authority structure, each answering different types of questions, where the authority structure in science is really a method. It is not a particular text or individual. It is you arbitrate your differences through the scientific method. But it leaves, it's very powerful. It has the Popperian falsifiability criterion, all of that. But it leaves whole classes of questions which cannot be answered by that method, such as, what should I do about A, B, or C? There is not really a scientific answer to that. Why does the universe exist? What is the purpose of life? These kinds of questions are not amenable to uh, experimental uh, empirical answers, and they are in that other domain, the domain of religion, ethics, uh, philosophy. And these are not scientific questions. However, there are people now who say, no, that in fact, the two types of knowledge have to find a meeting place. And there are those who would say, let's keep them separate. They're both part of our consciousness, much as, for example, we appreciate art, 
beautiful painting or music, neither through morality nor through chemical analysis of the composition of the pigments of a Rembrandt painting, you appreciate the painting for what it is and speaks to you at a certainly different level. What do you think about this issue of science and religion? Richard? I, I think they can live very well together if they are properly handled. And I think our world of experience is highly multidimensional. And we cannot just boil it down on a one-dimensional array of facts and we say this is religion and this is science and so on and science is in contradiction with religion. It, they happen on different levels, so to say. And science obviously has to, to deal with, with facts, with uh, explanations of, of, of nature, natural phenomena, reproducible phenomena, and religion has much more to do with emotions, with feelings, with our sense of life. You don't have to be a religious to have this kind of emotions. But, but there are these two domains, and, and that this other domain cannot be approached very well by scientific means. And you, you need, I mean, everybody feels that. In yeah, we need both, but in other words, one should not pretend that... Uh, uh, or maybe one should, I don't know. I'm just asking, for example, uh, that you, to be a scientist, you absolutely have to be an atheist, as Richard Dawkins or, or Hitchens are saying, or vice versa, that uh, you have to bring uh, creationism into science uh, and the application of science curricula. So we can keep the, we have them both within ourselves, but we reflect on them in, in different levels. This is what you were saying, in different levels. Of course the problem occurs in fundamentalism. Christian fan fundamentalism and Islamic fan fundamentalism, which are strongly to be condemned. I mean, they really have no right for existence. But otherwise, I think religion and emotions and ethics and feelings, they are here and they are important for us. They are important inspiration for our work, aren't they, Shari? I, I don't think about the problems very often. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Through scientists. <laughs> they, uh, Thorsten, you want to add to that? I, 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 yeah. I, as as a, a person who has, was raised on, the, on radioactivity, uh, and using it to uh, measure dates going past into past time. Uh, and if you get to 25,000 years with carbon-14, uh, then that suggests to me that there actually were 25,000 years. Uh, and so I, I have difficulty with someone that think there have only been 6,000. Uh, well, uh, somehow we in Egypt also have difficulty with people who think that the whole history of the world was only 6,000 years when we have recorded history of over 7,000 years. So <laughs> we ourselves are, are kind of likely to, uh, to uh, go along with you on that. Most I, people I, I'm more interested in, in the mechanics of the, of the social problem that was involved in getting for Professor Libby to do carbon-14 dating a, uh, a large chunk of wood from a funeral ark taken from an Egyptian tomb. Uh, there the, the question was, was uh, you shouldn't touch this uh, archaeological artifact. Uh, that I think they finally persuaded him to give them a piece of wood that you can't see was missing. But it was a, a bigger problem to convince them to, to let them measure carbon-14 than it was uh, that they might to say it was over, well, they wouldn't say probably over 6,000 years. No, indeed, indeed. But, you know, the, in the past also, I think great scientists have maintained these two domains, the way Richard Ernst was mentioning, that they, they are with us, but they are different. Uh, Newton, the great Newton, also did biblical studies, and there he was using chapter and verse, but when he did the Principia Mathematica, or the... the global cosmology was using 
what we would refer to as scientific observation mathematical models. So he kept the two separate. And in our Muslim tradition, the great uh, uh, Muslim scientists of the 10th to the, the 15th century who really carried the torch of learning did the same thing. Ibn al-Haytham in the 10th century has the empirical method explained and he says we should not accept the authority of anybody and we're doing empirical science based on observation. And the others did the same. And they, said, and they were also deeply religious people so they kept these, they recognized these two levels that Richard was talking about. I, I, Go ahead. There was a news item within a couple of weeks ago about a new calculation that said that the universe was 13.579 or 597 uh, years old, times 10 to, 10 to the ninth billion, billion, years, years. billion years old. And I wondered about the five significant figures in that calculation. Yeah, I, I also wonder, I was told somebody, do you realize that in fact the uh, whole universe may end in five billion years? I said, well, you know, it's five billion or seven billion or three billion years. Somehow I'm not getting very excited about that. It's a little bit beyond my, uh, my ken to be able to measure or to assess even. But uh, Thorsten, you wanted to comment on that? Yeah, I think that as a brain scientist, uh, uh, in answer to come back to religion, it seems to me that uh, the, our minds are so built that the concept of, uh, of uh, uh, some higher function that is expressed in different religions in different ways, all in our own minds, and the expression varies depending on the environment in which you live. But that, my feeling is to come back to Richard's point of tolerance earlier today that one would have to look upon the expression of various religions in terms of the social condition in which people live. If you live in the wild, or if you live in the big city, or if you live in poverty, etc. The needs of the human mind is, on the human body will be such that that will be the expression of the, the uh, beliefs and whatever form, if it's a dogmatic religion or, or whatever. But it's something that one will tell you that if extremism come up, is, that's an expression of social ill. And that should be watched and try to treated and dealt with rather than being uh, met with violence itself. So I think religion is a very interesting uh, or beliefs is a very interesting aspect of the human mind that we should, we still don't understand very well but sh should be looked upon perhaps yes, in a different way. But I'm glad you brought up this point of, uh, of um, the social ill. Uh, the person I was just mentioning, Ibn al-Haytham, uh, who was a, a great figure in optics and uh, other sciences uh, in the Muslim world in, uh, in uh, the 10th century, the turn of the 10th to the 11th century, uh, six centuries before Galileo, um, he was not uh, attacked in that society. He was tolerated. Uh, Galileo, as you know, was forced to recant uh, in 1633. Uh, at the same time, in that same society, there was tolerance even of, I'm saying this for our young people here, Abu Ala al Ma'arri, great uh, uh, poet and writer, uh, who wrote uh, very dubious things on uh, religion and belief. And not only this blind man living in a small village between Aleppo and Damascus was never attacked, never killed, his, his writings were not banned, they have arrived to us to this day. And people were even able to make the distinction of saying, I disagree with what he writes about faith and religion, but he is a brilliant linguist and a talented poet. So that distinction was even able in a society in the 10th to the 11th century to be that tolerant, and that's why they carried the torch of learning. But let me ask a question, because this is about attitude towards science today. Public attitudes towards science. Are they science and scientists? Are they more hostile 
or more sympathetic than they were before? And if so, why, in your judgment? Public attitudes in your societies. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a research uh, science organization in the United States that asks public for, and they give the figure that over 75% of the general public is in favor of science. So, at least, I don't know if similar studies have been made in, in Europe, but I think in general, my uh, belief is that there's a positive view of science, even if there are some worried because of, of certain development that, uh, but in general, people realize that why life, why the standard of living is what it is, is based to a large extent on science. Richard? Richard. I think it has much to do with, with the time we are living in. And I mean, our time is characterized by, by the limits of growth. And we feel these limits of growth everywhere. And, and they are a, a reality for people, and people are afraid of it, and they ask who is responsible for that. And then finally they find, yeah, it's, a, it's science to be blamed. But of course, after all, it was not science who, who led society to these limits. It was our craving for for wealth, it was industry wanted to make profits. But of course, the foundation was laid by, by science, but I don't think that can be blamed for that. So for, I think for the wrong reason, science got, in, in, got the bad image in, in the context of, of our difficulties, which we experience in our today's world. But there's an attitude that says, perhaps uh, more, more prevalently now than, than before, uh, saying that, well, uh, scientists uh, are not as objective as they claim to be. Uh, science is another form of discourse affected by its own uh, pol political and ideological constructs. Uh, and that certainly is a view that's propagated by a number of people in the humanities and the social sciences. But don't you think that, I mean, in my experience has been that the, the media, their knowledge of science is getting better and better, but they are to very, have a great responsibility in providing the right information to the public uh, about new development in science. For example, modified, genetically modified food products, for example that was mishandled in Europe and led to these problems, whereas in America it was never a problem. So, so and that depends, I think, to a large extent that this, the science writing in newspapers and magazines is at much higher standard in the United States than in, in many other countries. And I think that's a, very important to, uh, to try to encourage students to go into science and science writing because it's now a, a very a good profession in, in the States. I don't know, again, from Europe. Uh, Indeed. Share with you. I, I think the, the circumstances uh, before and after World War II were so different that uh, it's hard to compare the, how science was looked at before uh, 1942, the, Discovery of the discovery and applications of of, of fiction of fission, uh, changed the, that that put something on the front page that was never going to go away, and before that that wasn't true. I mean, I, I remember a story about uh, Harold Urey. I I think the story I, I can't vouch for the figures, but the general idea that he received a grant of, let's say, $7,000 uh, sometime in the middle 30s, and he couldn't think of how he could possibly spend that. So he gave $3,500 of it to a physics colleague who used it to buy the equipment on which he got a Nobel Prize. Uh, but the, the failure of imagination of how to spend $3,500 uh, 
it doesn't go very far with your modern scientist. <laughs> no, I think there is no uh, lack of imagination on how to spend money, especially among the physics community, uh, considering the uh, Large Hadron Collider and the <laughs> uh, other types of gadgets that might be uh, used and the questions that could be probed uh, quite expensively. Uh, you're right, things have changed. But that brings us to perhaps a, a related question. How can television and internet and other forms of mass media be used more to propagate the scientific outlook in science and encourage greater support, public support for science than to propagate uh, uh, numerology instead of mathematics, astrology instead of astronomy, etc.? Any suggestions? Use of media? Yes, go ahead. No, I, I don't try to talk about subjects of which I'm ignorant. Oh, my. Okay, well, some of us are not as modest, uh, Sherwood, so uh, Richard, would you like to... I'll join. I'll be, I'll be the first one to, to speak about that, but go ahead, Richard. I'd like to hear your opinion on that. I, I think Internet has become enormously important for, for communication of science facts, and I use it daily, perhaps hourly, to, to get what I ever want to know about the field which is not completely directly connected to what I'm doing daily. For that, I think it's, it's a marvelous tool and it does a great job and I'm sure it will be even further enriched in, in, in the future. So I, I think it's an indispensable tool for, for usage of science, for promoting science and I like it very much. But do you think that television, uh, the other mass medium that is very prevalent today, could do a better job of uh, bringing science to the public than what exists today? No, yeah, I, I, I don't want to flatter uh, you, but it seems to me some of the program you mentioned this morning uh, that you are initiating here is the kind of things you like to see. And uh, after my talk, uh, uh, Ronald Laporte from Pittsburgh, who is involved in the program for science education and so on. I mean, there is a, a, a core of people who are really excited about the possibilities to develop programs and, and inform uh, the general public and students in particular on in science. And, and so. uh, thank you for that endorsement. And people in the audience who have big checkbooks, please remember this. We will be coming back to you afterwards and saying this is a deserving activity <laughs> that may need your support, especially the CEOs of corporations who want to think about a useful way to spend some excess profits. <laughs> we can make use of that. But let me stay with some of the questions that have come from the audience because uh, one of them is uh, uh, a, uh, a, an important uh, question that was um, uh, also posed by a previous chair, which is, uh, what was it, what was the moment, if you remember it, in your youth, the turning point that put you onto the path of becoming research scientists of such excellence that later on you were all rewarded by the highest accolade that your scientific colleagues can give you, which is the Nobel Prize. What was it that turned you towards science? And when did it happen? Was it at a very young age, or is it something in college? I know, for example, uh, I spoke to Jerome Friedman, uh, uh, who's uh, the institute professor at MIT, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics, and he was studying art. And uh, he read uh, Einstein's uh, little book on relativity, and that turned him towards uh, uh, science and physics. And he went on to win a Nobel Prize in physics. So there's a very specific moment in his case which shifted him from the study of art to physics. And is there any similar moment, uh, epiphany for any of you, Richard? Go ahead. Thank you. I mean, in my case, it happened very early. I was about 13 years old. I was exploring our old house. I went into the attic and found there a box that contained the last remainders of an uncle who died in 1923, and these, re these remainders were his chemicals. 
his chemicals which he used for photography. So I took this box down into the basement. I started to play with it. I made explosions. I survived. Our house survived. <laughs> and then I de decided to become a chemist. And then I was, during studies of chemistry, I was disappointed more and more by, by the understanding of chemistry at that time. I felt it's not possible to understand science, so let's do something useful with it. So I tried to use science for, for getting something for society out of it, and that led me into magnetic resonance and to the development of techniques. I still don't, don't understand it, but at least it's useful. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thorsten, how about you? Is there a particular moment that turned you in towards science? Or were you just always... No, not really. I, 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 was, uh, um, I was interested. I, I grew up in a mental hospital because my father was a psychiatrist, head of the hospital. And... Uh, so uh, I um, then decided to go into medicine and, and uh, in a way follow my father's footstep. But then I realized uh, soon as I was practicing that our knowledge about the brain was uh, very limited and that I, the treatment available, etc., made me decide this is, this is cookbook stuff. I want to really understand how things work. So I went into science. So it was very kind of, not very interesting, but it was a logical kind of way of, of developing my, my thoughts about how to get into. And then I was, you know, in science you have to be fortunate also, get into a good situation and have good colleagues and students, etc. So I have been a very fortunate man. Share with all of you. I, well, I, I should I preface it by saying that I grew up in a household that expected me certainly to go to college, uh, probably to graduate school, and certainly if I went to graduate school, it would be the University of Chicago because that was the best university in the world. Now that was, that was the milieu in which I grew up, and uh, they allowed me the choice of field. Uh, that is, I could be a chemist or a physicist or a mathematician or uh, Maybe, maybe if I showed any talent for writing, be a writer, but I didn't. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was really my, my encounter with Willard Libby of realizing uh, how enjoyable it must have been for him to have something that was, was a creation of his own mind that, that turned out to revolutionize archaeology, which he didn't know before, but that which, uh, was the outcome from the carbon-14 dating. And having uh, lived close to that and being in his research group, they said, it's a pretty good field. I think I'll stay with it. Mm. Carbon-14 was the catalyst. I can tell you what shifted me away from being a scientist. Mm -hmm. And it was, I was reminded by Richard's case. When I was a, a young boy, my family encouraged me very much because I had a very curious mind. I was involved with many, many different things. And I even had a chemistry lab. And then one day my mother came and asked me what was I studying. I said, well, I love chemistry. And I have two particular topics I'm working on. One is explosives and the other is poisons. <laughs> Whereupon my mother immediately said, I have a very interesting gift for you, a microscope. <laughs> Come and look at all the interesting animals and plants and things that are very different from chemistry. Forget that smelly old chemicals there. So I started on that and I got into that and then for a while, I, then I brought scorpions home. So uh, then uh, my father said to me, well, aren't you interested in physics? And I said, well, maybe, I don't know, let's, what, what about physics? So I started learning about physics, and uh, then I decided I wanted to become a physicist. By that time I was in high school. And uh, then my father, a very pragmatic man, said, and what are you going to do with that? I said, what do you mean, Just physics? And he said, why don't you try to do something that will help the social problems that you see around you? 
And that shifted me from engineering. I was then went into engineering, and then from engineering, I went into city and regional planning, economics, development issues, education, and I devoted my life to trying to work with societies and social problems, using science whenever possible, but I gave up on being a scientist. But it reminded me when you said about the explosions and so on, <laughs> that this was, <laughs> in my case, <laughs> the turning point that kept me going further and further away until we got to society. That brings us to another question from the, the floor, aside from that one. How did you spend your time as students? Students here want to know. Were you really focused on your area, or did you explore all the avenues that a university can offer when you were studying? Were you really focused on or did you use the time to, to go wide and then come back deep. I think that I should be first because I was a very bad student. <laughs> I was rather lazy and more interested in, in sports and girls than <laughs> in, in studying. Uh, it, it, um, so, so I'm sure my colleague, leading biographies of most uh, sci prominent scientists, they have been already from the beginning uh, focused on, on their future. Uh, shall we go ahead? Again? I would not claim that I was a, a hard worker. Uh, I was, as he said, interested in sports. Um, well, see that, guys? You're, you're all in line for a Nobel Prize, even though you've been goofing off. <laughs> Only Richard Ernst was studying hard. Richard, <laughs> were you studying hard or were you also a sportsman? And the I, as a graduate student, I played on the, baseball, the university baseball team. And then on summers, I played semi-professional baseball uh, and enjoyed that thoroughly and found out that there were reasons why I wasn't playing professional baseball. Semi-professional <laughs> only. Semi-professional <laughs> only. Richard, how about you? Were you also a sportsman? And, uh, uh, I always try to be different than anybody else. I never wanted to be comparable to anybody. And so first of all, I had this chemistry lab. Nobody else in my class had a chemistry lab at home. Then I started to compose music. Nobody was composing music in, in my class. So I, I always try to do something special. Then I became destructive and started to demolish public goods. Nobody did that either so well as I did. <laughs> so I always try to do something different and to, so to say, to, to become myself and not to copy anybody. So that was my attitude during my, my youth and my, my studies. And finally, it led to something. Well, well, guys, all of you, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, it's still ahead of you. You can make the Nobel Prize too. You know, nothing's lost. <laughs> nothing's lost yet. But uh, that brings a question because I said ladies and gentlemen, and as you know, in the Library of Alexandria, we are very, not only gender balanced, we are very supportive of the uh, excellence of women uh, that we have and who constitute the majority of our staff. Uh, the question is here in front of me, uh, why are all speakers on the stage right now men? And more generally put, I will place the question that has been posed. And if I may remind you, remember that a wrong answer can cost you a lot, as Larry Summers learned. <laughs> a wrong answer can cost you a lot. Uh, why are there so few Nobel Prize women, uh, Nobel Prize winning women in science? What in your judgment is the, the reason for that? I, uh, first, first thing I'd say is, uh, pardon to my colleagues, but you're looking a lot of old guys. Uh, your, your question of, of why did the, the group of people who went to graduate school in the 1950s 
have so many men. That was that's a comment on the society in 1950, uh, and it's certainly has changed very markedly. But they, but the Nobel Prize winners, once they get a Nobel Prize, only get older, and they usually start fairly old anyway. So that, that's you're looking at, at the mid mid 19th. So it was a societal construct that existed at the time that tended to keep women away from that school in the sciences in the 50s and 60s. 60s it changed. That was when women's lib came in and a lot of things came in. Uh, Richard, do you have an observation on that? Uh, it has a lot to do with the structure of our societies. And it's a, it's a historical development which put uh, women in, into a different position than men, and they had a different function. And it, it was certainly not science that was at the forefront of, of a female activity. And of course, I mean, raising children is still a very important issue for, for ladies, much more than for men. They have less liberty in this respect. And especially at, at the particular age where we normally find our way into science, they are engaged with different activities, having young children at home. Uh, and they are certainly disfavored in, in this way. Of course, religion also plays an enormous role, and you see it in, in these areas here. I mean, it, it's a very diverse and difficult situation here to analyze. I mean, yeah, many, many different factors come in, but mostly social factors. That's what it boils down to. Prosten, would you say that? You were president of the university. Did you have any difficulty in looking at the... <laughs> you know, I, I, think, uh, I think women have been... Uh, Treated as as Richard said er, today earlier uh, badly in 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 terms of in academic life they have not given uh, when I became president at Rockefeller in 90, that was in ninety end of ninety one uh, there were no professor woman professor uh, and this uh, is not a long time ago uh, so now uh, currently I think there are at least. Uh, uh, close to over a dozen professors, uh, and this is a small university, it's only a total of about 50 professors, but still. Uh, so I think uh, uh, some, the, nowadays, uh, the number of women graduate uh, in American university uh, is, is nearly, in some areas, 50-50, in some areas, in psychology, there are more women PhD than men, and uh, in, even in physics and math, it's, it's uh, the number of women uh, uh, is, in, in, is increasing. So I think there is a, a dramatic change. When I came to Harvard Medical School uh, in, in 59, there were about 27% women, and now there are over 50%. So uh, I think women is slowly taking over the world. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm optimistic, and in a few years there will be uh, more women Nobel laureates as well, uh, and uh, it's just a matter of time. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I, I share that view, and I also like to tell our guests here and in the audience that in Egypt this is increasingly true. Uh, the percentage of women in the engineering and science colleges is increasing and it's over 50% in some cases, and in some departments of the so-called natural sciences or the hard sciences, uh, the majority of the staff uh, now getting doctorates are women. So uh, this is a, a, an important development that confirms what you were just saying. Now I have here a series of, uh, of uh, uh, rapid-fire questions that I will ask at each one of you for very short answers just to uh, uh, liven up the debate a bit, and then we'll come back to some of the more thoughtful questions. Uh, the, uh, the first of these is uh, uh, we speak much less of the ozone uh, layer right now. Uh, we speak a lot more about uh, climate change and global warming. Is the ozone problem resolved by the banning of CFCs? The Montreal Protocol has just celebrated its 20th anniversary the um, 
concentration of chlorofluorocarbon-11 in the lower atmosphere has been going down since uh, about 10 years ago. The concentration of fluorocarbon-12, which is longer lived and takes longer for it to be really affected, has been level for the last several years. Uh, so uh, we, the, the Montreal Protocol, in its uh, present terms, and it keeps getting slightly modified, but it's picking up loose ends. Uh, it's been a, a, an enormous success, uh, and uh, so that the, the uh, I think, deservedly less. I mean, it, there are more questions about does it tell us any lessons for climate change than there are about what should we do. I should should say, though, that the, that more effective than anything in the Kyoto Protocol so far has been uh, the what's been done on CFCs, that the because they are greenhouse gases too, and they've had more effect. The, the suppression of the green of the CFCs has a, had more effect than the, any of the activities on carbon-14, on, on, sorry, carbon-14, on carbon, carbon dioxide. dioxide. On, than on carbon dioxide and methane. So that it's, uh, yeah. uh, it, I, it's deservedly in the news. A related question also just requires an, a one number answer or close to an estimate. Uh, how long will it take for nature to repair the ozone, the ozone hole? The, the lifetime of the longer lived compound is 100 years. Uh, but the, the lifetime is an average process, which, which means that uh, currently we're running about 540 parts per trillion of fluorocarbon-12. That will be around 270 in 2100, around uh, 100 and 2200, around 35 and 2300. So it'll be here for a long time, but in increasing, but uh, being a, it goes away about 1% a year. The other one goes 2%. So damage done quickly takes a long time to repair. That is the bottom line I think we should learn, even after we stop. And that's also true for what happens on climate change, because what we're talking about, even if we cap the CO2 emissions, uh, the continued effect will be where we are today, and not going back to where we were a hundred years ago. There, there's no discussion of how to make carbon dioxide go back. That's right. uh, there is discussion on how to make methane go back, but uh, the carbon dioxide is more, much more important than methane. Okay, uh, a separate question. In your judgment, very quickly, uh, why, as we heard from uh, Jeff Sachs, is so much money being poured into war than it is into science? And uh, what can scientists do to increase the support that goes to science, since science does so much good for humanity? Anything you'd like to say on that? I think uh, whenever we have an effect, it's a long-term effect in education. And we can hope that when we educate new generations that perhaps in, in 20, 30, 50 years something will change. But in the short term, I don't think we will have any influence whatsoever. Okay. Next question is, uh, uh, can you just state a quick opinion on uh, using embryonic stem cells from doomed embryos to cure neurological conditions? Is this something that poses ethical problems for, for you or not? Uh, no, I, uh, <coughs> I'm not really, uh, I don't think it puts an ethical problem for me, it's just a matter of that whole technology and this whole is still uh, in an early stage of development, so I, I think uh, the, but there are promises uh, uh, in, for Parkinson's disease and other uh, where embryonic cells can uh, be programmed to uh, repair damage. The, um... uh, in teaching science, open question to all three of you, in teaching science, uh, how much of a balance, how much of time should be devoted to teaching the technique, the discovery, the methodology of science, and how much towards this broader and softer aspect of thinking 
about potential applications and the ethics of uh, what is being pursued. You're talking about education at what level? Uh, it's not specified, so uh, I, will, I will, since the question in front of me is not specified, I will just specify it broadly and say from high school through college. Any particular view? I, I, I was going to answer to long before that, that the, uh, the absence of chemistry sets, for instance, probably deters people from becoming scientists because that the, the chance to do your own experiment and draw your own conclusions if, if it's not not available uh, uh, otherwise, you'd, but you'd certainly hope that your, uh, high, school, your high school and even grade schools would be giving experimental uh, beginnings to their education. Uh, okay. Now there's a particular question to Richard Ernst from uh, a colleague in the audience who says, your presentation was marvelous but uh, I think you're placing too much of the blame on the problems of the world on the Americans, and that's highly unfair because you should be aware that the Chinese uh, are doing an enormous amount of damage to environmental degradation uh, and uh, that they are equally hesitant to join the Kyoto Protocol. Comment, please. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I, I normally draw black and white pictures with color slides. <laughs> and I, I mean, if you have to give a concentrated lecture, you, you have to focus on something and you have to blame somebody. But uh, it's true. I mean, the truth is a little bit more diverse. And of course, the, what I think is that the United States mostly serves for us as a role model. But I mean, it has lost this function a long time ago, and we should be careful to follow it in this respect. But the Chinese are not the role model for us, and, and that they have made a lot of errors. I mean, just think about Tibet in, in the moment. I, I mean, that's clear to everybody, so one doesn't have to mention it. So, I mean, it's not a val very balanced uh, uh, exposition of all the problems in the world which I made this morning. Oh, thank you. I understand that's fair enough. Now, uh, shifting in a slightly different way, this is a very specific question, but a very important one, I think, to all of you. Uh, uh, recently, the United States destroyed in space a satellite full of toxic wastes, too toxic to bring down to Earth. Is, is this the beginning of humans polluting outer space with toxins, and is there a negative implication on space pollution on life on Earth, and should there not be, in fact, a uh, scientific uproar about how we start treating outer space? I would have thought that the concern about uh, the, the outer space was more about militarizing it than it was about pollution. Well, it turns out apparently, if I may correct it, that uh, many of the, there's an enormous amount of space junk mm -hmm. that is floating around and that uh, a space vehicle right now is at risk because they go so fast when they are in orbit that uh, of hitting these very tiny pieces of junk so that we uh, who uh, are trying to learn not to throw garbage, as one of your slides Richard showed this morning, garbage, uh, on our environment on Earth are apparently doing it with abandon uh, uh, on space. And uh, you're right about militarizing space, uh, but uh, uh, on the question of, uh, of uh, polluting space with uh, toxins, radioactive materials, uh, other things that would be put out there, do we have a responsibility to address that? And, and should the, this be something that scientists should take the lead in? Actually, it's interesting. Uh, I, Alain Pompidou uh, of France uh, came here at our conference on ethics of science and technology, and he specifically is a leading expert on the ethics of dealing with space. And he's been advocating that there should be protocols uh, similar to the protocols that were signed for Antarctica. 
protocols to protect Antarctica for uh, well, Antarctica science and wildlife as we know, but uh, and demilitarize it, and that the same thing is is and should be done for space. And he was very concerned about the amount of material that is being put in orbit and that is uh, basically being junked. So we're kind of creating our own asteroid belt around us with, uh, with junk of our space material that will make future exploration also very difficult and very risky. I don't think there's any question that, that that's true, that, that the junk is accumulating and, and there, at, lots of it is accumulating uh, at distances that means it will be there for hundreds of years. So the, and there's not much you can do about that that's there except try to put a cap on, on it. And it's hard to do that without giving up space entirely. So it's a, a real conundrum as to what the, what the path is. Well, let me bring it back. Now, this is not from the, the question, but it's from me. Uh, bring it back to something closer to us. Uh, and I think you all know the devastating reality, uh, already, already the late Jacques-Yves Cousteau who was a good friend of mine, was telling me uh, that there is no part of the ocean anywhere on this planet that doesn't have some traces of uh, pollution from uh, human activity. And uh, increasingly there are areas right now which are basically floating in flotsam and jetsam of, uh, of garbage that was thrown there. Uh, for a long time, we have had kind of two mental models of humans and the environment. One I may call uh, the cowboy uh, model and one is the space model. The cowboy model, we see all these beautiful pictures in Western riding into the sunset and there's a very tiny person in a huge landscape and or in our part of the world, somebody going into the desert with a small camel, very small, and therefore whatever that person is going to do in terms of impact is not going to have a major impact on that huge amount. The other extreme, of course, is the space capsule, where you have to calculate everything from the air they breathe to the excreta to the food that they're going to eat, etc., and how all of this will be cycled in, because everything is controlled and we are living in between. But we're discovering two things, that we are moving much faster towards the limits, uh, perhaps not so much on the raw materials as we are on the ability to recycle. Certainly we're beginning to feel that, whether ozone layer, climate change, uh, uh, recycling. And because of the materials, that desert that would recycle any organic material cannot handle a plastic bag. A plastic bag would remain and would not be degraded in that environment and would continue to pollute it. So given these two dimensions, what should we do? I'm not talking about climate change right now, but about dealing with that bottom part of Richard's diagram, which is all this enormous solid waste that we are unleashing on the world. I think, I mean, these problems are real global problems in the true sense of the world. They affect everybody and uh, there are no borders anymore. And I think that's really one of the best motivations to have international laws. And we have to collaborate much better between countries. And I mean, this individualistic approach of certain countries, and I don't want to mention the name again, I mentioned it before or too often already, I mean, this is not tenable anymore. We have to work together, we have to maintain international agreements in order to solve these kind of problems. I, no, well, I, I would say, uh, if when, when we go back to considering the Montreal Protocol, uh, the first, uh, first regulation that, of any kind that was uh, put in place was put in by the state of Oregon one year after our first publication. They banned the use of CFCs in aer as aerosol propellants in 1975. 
who, who state, of, state of Oregon. State of Oregon. The, the next year, the, the United States banned the use of, announced the ban taking effect in 1978, the use of CFCs. So uh, I would hope that uh, the past few years is just an aberration from behavior that before that uh, was and perhaps uh, raising people's hopes uh, in other countries that, that the U.S. would lead the way. Uh, I did talk about the, the Supreme Court making having a decision in uh, April of uh, 2007. The administration has not acted on it yet. So ha have uh, many countries signed the protocol? Or? It, in, the Montreal it, Protocol, has it been signed by? 125. 125. Or, yeah, and it's, it's it, enforced. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it's, and in the case of this particular protocol, because you're asking what, where you put a gas, and they, once you put a gas in the atmosphere, it mixes it north and south, you can't hide it. Um, and so one knows that it, that it is working because we, we're measuring the fluorocarbon 11 and 12 that's put in as accumulated for the whole earth. If they didn't put it in, then it's not a problem. That's true, and it is one of the great successes, and I'm, I think we're all proud of uh, the enormous achievements of uh, uh, Professor Roland, Professor Molina, and others in, in, in explaining the mechanism, but also uh, here in Egypt we should be proud of the role that uh, Dr. Mustafa Tolba played, uh, who was then the head of UNEP, in bringing these countries together to the approval of the, what became the Montreal Protocol. Uh, when I was at the World Bank involved with the environment and uh, we created a global environment facility, we adopted the Montreal Protocol as one of the four areas, the ozone uh, there, and that already had its mechanism and its fund, which incidentally was run by another Egyptian, Omar Arini. So we have uh, a lot of uh, Egyptians involved in supporting the Montreal Protocol. Uh, over the years. Uh, but the, the issue, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to be nasty because I have to tell you uh, that this issue uh, also touches on science. Uh, again, I've been involved for a long time with Africa and uh, there has been uh, regretfully terrible cases of European countries uh, sending toxic waste to African countries and dumping uh, their toxic waste uh, on uh, African shorelines and, what and of course bribing local officials uh, to sign agreements whereby uh, this would be acceptable. Because if you ask the question, why is it that if they are putting a, uh, uh, the, the, the toxic uh, stuff on a, on a boat and send it all the way from Europe to Africa, why don't they just dump it in the ocean somewhere? And the answer is because according to European law, it's illegal to dump it in the ocean. And if the, the ship went out with toxic waste and then came back without it, they could be prosecuted in Europe unless they could show that they had voluntarily deposited it somewhere where somebody was willing to take it. Now, of the many things that have been foisted on the poor of the world, that surely is one of the worst. And uh, we have recently cases both in Guinea and Cote d'Ivoire where there has been a, a negative impact on the health of the local residents as a result of, uh, of such uh, dumping. There's equally, on a different question, there are serious issues being raised about uh, solid waste uh, dumps where you, uh, earth fills, where you supposedly bury it into the earth and the packing of this material and what it does to uh, underwater leaching and other materials, especially toxic chemicals. Uh, do you think we need international regulations and standards on these issues that today seem not to exist? And if so, is that something we should be at the forefront of demanding or is it uh, let's fight one battle at a time and let's focus on climate change and leave these other issues on the side. Well, uh, all that I don't know anything about it except what I read, but uh, the, 
registration of all the ships in countries that don't really have navies uh, and the, the yeah, Liberia and Panama and so on, among the biggest flag carriers in the world, right? <laughs> the, the prevalence of uh, pirates in the southeast, in the China Sea and so on, says this is a, an uncontrolled group and it's going to be very hard. To, it'll probably all the more reason for trying to do some, some uh, limitations on, on all of the things that are so easily, it's very hard to keep track of, uh, of what's going on, but, it, but it's an area that seems... Uh, to me, more, more uh, rife with illegality than most areas of, the, of commerce. Yes, Richard? No, I, I think in general, I mean, free market economy doesn't work. It's not functional. I mean, it's always on the account of the weakest ones, and it's completely unfair to, to those who, who suffer. But they are being exploited, and free market means exploited those who can be exploited. Thorsten, do you have any comment on that? No, not really. It's, it's sort of a, an area which one reads about, but again, because I have a Nobel Prize doesn't give me any particular insight into these issues that I haven't studied. Uh, I think the free, the whole market. Uh, I, I hope our young people are struck by the modesty of our guests and compare that frequently to some of the people that you meet who uh, uh, do not accept the famous Islamic dictum of the great jurist who said, وَمَنْ قَالَ لَا أَدْرِي فَقَدْ أَفْتَى And that was a great jurist who was being asked for his judgment on a number of things and he said, if I say I do not know, there is enough. And that did not diminish his standing in, uh, in uh, our societies. And I think I'm always stunned by the modesty of Thorsten on some of these issues. But let me turn to something that you know and I've worked with a lot. Uh, this is a question from a colleague here. A very important issue has been raised, which is the issue of brain drain versus brain circulation. I like to even put it in a catchier terms is from brain drain to brain gain because uh, brain gain uh, uh, really is about the fact that knowledge is one of those rare commodities that you can share with others and still retain. It's the quintessential public good. Uh, I, I give you my knowledge, you give me your knowledge and we both come out richer at the end. We've kept what we had and we've gained some more and therefore the exchange of knowledge and information is wonderful. How can we ensure that we can reach out to some of the best and brightest scientists in the developing world, give them the chances that they are deprived of if they are in a place like Sudan or uh, Iraq or wherever it is, and, uh, and where they can get a, a chance to participate, but at the same time where there is this circulation of brain power. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a difficult problem. and. That's, as I mentioned in my presentation about the Latin American program, that, to, to, uh, that had been a very good brain circulation in that program, even if uh, uh, the, as they return back home, uh, it has not been necessarily easy for them to continue to carry on the research at the same level as in the laboratories they were trained in the United States. In uh, many students coming from Europe uh, to United States in the program, Human Frontier Science program, I have a very good, we get, uh, we, we fund about 100 students a year, and uh, over a 10 year period, uh, there are 1,000 students, and nearly half of them stay in the United States and do not return back to their home countries. And, and so that, to my mind, is is because the opportunities in the United States are getting a good job, getting support for doing the kind of research I've been trained to do, they are very good. And the, the home country uh, is, is not 
often meeting the responsibility to, to provide the opportunities for the young people who really like to go back home if they could continue to work as before. Uh, and the only, in my experience, United States, Britain has been developed a program very similar to the one we developed at Human Frontiers to provide uh, support for students coming back, give them money and uh, positions. And, uh, but many co other countries uh, uh, have not addressed this issue, to my mind, in a, in a serious enough fashion. It's just a matter, matter of saying, do you want to develop science in, in your country and then invest in young people? I mean, the, 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 uh, and so that the brain circulation uh, would be beautiful if the governments in the various countries really met their responsibilities or see to that they provided opportunities. If they because, did the right thing. Yes. Yeah, you know, I'm an example of a brain drain. I <laughs> left Sweden <laughs> and stayed in the United States for 50 years, so I'm, I'm not a good example. But, uh, but uh, still, but somehow Sweden is not exactly an impoverished country uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, either uh, brain power, but uh, I think you're the quintessential global citizen and we're very proud to have you here. Uh, my experience with Asian postdoctorals and graduate students sort of is mostly with the pre-mainland Chinese, that is Taiwanese, uh, or from Hong Kong when it was still <laughs> a British protectorate uh, or Japanese and for a long time the quick answer to what happens to them after they finish with your lab with the Japanese they're all on Honshu and with the Chinese they're all in the United States but later like the last 10 or 12 years or so Taiwan is a sufficiently vibrant society first-rate science uh, that they are drawing people going back. So that's, that's a long-term uh, effect, but it, but it has, certainly has populated Taiwan with a lot of very well-trained and very excellent scientists working in, in the U.S., but not just the U.S., Western science generally. But they've gone back and given Taiwan a very strong uh, academic ability in science. Indeed they are, yes. Richard? Yeah, I don't think there is an easy solution out of this brain drain, brain gain problem. And it has much to do with the general state of a country. And it's a good indicator for, for that. If there is no brain drain, then the country is in a good state, and otherwise it has some kind of problems which are not so easily to be solved, just focusing on, on the brain drain problem itself. So I think the only thing is to, to try to live with it and to consider these who live as ambassadors for the country. Good. I, I think, in my experience, I have worked a fair amount in, in China uh, too, and they, I was told that about 300,000 Chinese students went to the United States and over, over 130,000 have returned back to China. And, and they are now in some institute providing the opportunities, actually the government investing in order to very rapidly build up the, the uh, scientific skills and experience and laboratories. Uh, really excellent uh, institution, center of excellence and university. So, and I have a similar experience in India also is now uh, working very hard to rebuild and invest money into science. So these are two countries, I think, that in the future people generally feel that science is moving east, that the dominance of, of the Western world may have reached its peak and that the shift is going to be east in, in the next 20, 30 years. Thank you. I have a last question that's just in a, in a firing away mode, uh, short answers to each. Many of us here in Egypt in many of the developing countries are deeply concerned about the issue of biofuels taking away food, raising food prices, resulting in, in, uh, rise, in riots in different places around the world. And we are questioning the wisdom of uh, the policy of uh, converting large-scale acreage away from uh, 
basic uh, food and feed material like corn towards uh, ethanol uh, and uh, other such examples. Uh, so uh, for those who are concerned about food security, uh, those who are concerned about the price of food and access to food, uh, what do you say about biofuels? Anybody? Short. It's hard to be too short, but uh, the, I, tell, I think we, we need it as a background. Uh, I'm not defending the policy, but I'm saying that uh, the, the people who are benefiting from it now, are, well, the, the farmers in Dakota and Iowa have been disappearing because it's not a, a paying business. And suddenly it's become a paying business because they're selling at the prices that have gone up. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a solution, it doesn't help as a solution to global warming because there, it requires some, too much fuel to make ethanol out of corn. Uh, what that needs to be directed is toward areas where, uh, you, where you can't plant corn, uh, keep corn for the, for the food market and get it to uh, switch grass or whatever. Yeah, for example, cellulosic grasses of different types. And so uh, what one would hope is it would very quickly uh, morph into a, uh, a, a, an aspect that, that it's waste ground that's being used for producing the fuel and that food, food ground is still being concerned for food. But that's, that's going to be a very tricky politics. Uh, Indeed. Richard. I, I think biofuels, that's uh, the ultimate uh, example of the misfunctioning of free market economy, that you uh, burn the, the food of the poor for driving the cars of the rich. And I think that should be prevented with all possible means. I think you have a very stark way of putting things. Uh, as you say, black and white is in using color slides. <laughs> but I see you can do it even with verbal expressions. Thorsten, do you want to add anything to this? No, I, I don't have a car. Ah, <laughs> a true environment. All right. Uh, I think the last thing I will turn to you each is if you want to give a message to our audience, a short message. Richard. A couple of sentences to uh, our audience. Very simple. Be honest. Speak up. Say what you think. Doesn't matter when you make errors from time to time. You can correct that later on. But honesty and openness, I think that's the, the academic attitude which you need under all circumstances. Sherry? I certainly second that vote, but I also commend the audience for still being here. <laughs> Dustin, what do you do? Yeah, I agree with both those two states. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> and on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to join me in uh, really uh, showing our appreciation to our panelists, uh, not only extremely distinguished scientists, not only great role models, but above all, great human beings. So please give a hand to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>